Next up, we have Nora, who will be speaking about gentrification as well, uh, and a different side of the perspective of what gentrification is. Yeah, Hello. Hi. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, all right. Hi. My name is Maura Rax. I'm a sophomore student at Loyola, studying political science and theology, and I have minors in urban studies and Catholic studies. Um, I actually am a longtime resident of Rogers Park, um, and my mom's here today, who's been living here since 1958. So, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, Rogers Park and Edgewater are important to me um, as our urban studies and community change. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about gentrification today and kind of Pope Francis' response to gentrification in my mind um, as a Catholic studies minor. So first, I want to take a moment and have you imagine a river. Earlier this month, I went on an alternative break immersion to West Virginia and stayed at Nazareth Farm, a community in the rural mountains. And on the farm's property was this tiny little river. It was cold and the world was frozen, but that tiny little river kept flowing. I like to think of communities as rivers. They are big or small or a nice size in between. They have a flow to them, but aren't without their rocky patches. The river is an ecosystem and so is a community. Rivers, like communities, suffer from pollution, extraction, and invasive species. Rivers, like communities, are beautiful and unique and strong. I think of gentrification, this very academic term for increased economic development and rising property values in an urban area as a dam in a river. A dam is placed in a river for its resources, to divert river flow, to reserve water, and sometimes even to create energy. But we can all agree that dams are built by outsiders to extract a river's resources. Often we see the benefits of a dam and we fail to see the negative impact of the damming on the river and all its intricate parts. The flow of a river is disrupted and the river is forced in new and different directions. Its ecosystem has changed. Gentrification does the same thing to neighborhood communities. Often, oftentimes, through this process of gentrification, communities are disrupted so violently that they quickly break apart and disperse. Families who have lived in their community for generations suddenly cannot afford their rent, not to mention the price of food down the street. Young urban professionals move in next door with little awareness of how their presence in the community is impacting the existing community. Low-income families, often families of color, sometimes refugees and immigrants, find themselves suddenly displaced. Those that have been advocating for their better community better schools, roads, filled potholes, increased policing, economic development, resources for their young and elderly, they will not be able to see the fruits of their labor. They have been pushed out before this community transformation that they have envisioned for decades ever happens. Gentrification is a deeply systemic and highly layered issue. When we talk about it, we cannot avoid a conversation about race, ethnicity, and the underlying racial implications of this outside, outsider-driven community change. In my urban policy class, we often discuss the way that race plays a key role in the conception and implementation of urban policies. Gentrification, ever so conveniently, was the topic of conversation in class last Friday. And we discussed gentrification not as a two-sided debate, but as a reality of racial dystopia and displacement. Yes, economic development is part of that conversation. Yes, increased safety, tree plantings, and bike lanes are part of it too. They are all part of the urban design of a rapidly changing community. The big question we need to ask though, is why are people getting displaced? Why does the race of the gentrifiers not mask the race of those gentrified? Is it yet another example of white colonialism, simply in a modern urban context? If we're digging deep into this issue, we need to ask the systematic question. Why is it that these, those who are displaced cannot afford the changes in living? Why are they unable to benefit from a clean, safe, vibrant community? Why are they in occupations that require them to live on aid and housing welfare? What does that say about our society as a whole? Who is being displaced and who is complicit in that displacement? Gentrification becomes a very simple conversation when you take into account the river this community, specifically the voices of those who are not traditionally heard. 
When a community inspires positive change, community development is not only acceptable, it is championed. When an alderman, investor, landlord, property owner, or business executive place the community and its needs as the first priority, neighborhood change is readily and happily accepted. Look at Pilsen, a vibrant and excited community just south of downtown. Pilsen has experienced significant changes in its community demographic over the years. Old German and Polish churches litter the streets along 18th and offer hints of the old Chicago immigrant population. Pilsen is now home to one of the largest Latino communities in the city. These churches are now surrounded by homes of Chicago's newest immigrant population and some of the best damn food in the city of Chicago. Pilsen has been slowly undergoing a process of gentrification and community leaders have been extremely focused on maintaining a seat at the table when decisions are made concerning the state of their community. And to a certain extent, their interests have been honored. New restaurants, vintage clothing stores, and trendy bars are scattered down 18th, while old businesses remain intact, residents remain in their homes, and the community remains thriving. The fight for Pilsen is not over, however. It is naive to say that a community that has begun gentrifying will magically stop once the vacant lots are filled and the storefronts are filled as well. Pilsen has a challenging road ahead of it, as more and more young urban professionals decide that Pilsen is a fun, cool, and trendy place to live without understanding the ramifications of their high rents and on the existing community. Pilsen, like communities across the United States, will struggle until the community members are in charge of their own destiny. They are directing, they are dictating and directing the change, not the outsiders. So how do rigorous community and Chicago neighborhoods tie into Pope Francis and disposable culture? The Pope talks a lot about the human condition in our society. In his papal exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, Francis discusses the culture in which we live. He consciously and compassionately highlights the areas in our society that have existed in darkness for too long. This quote-unquote globalization of indifference he speaks of is jarring to the ears. His words speak to the way we have become so absorbed in our lives, in our capitalist and material society, we easily forget our roots. Gentrification disrupts and displaces. Communities are disposed of. When we revive or beautify or develop as outsiders in a community, we are often blinded by our own commercial interests and fail to see the impact that gentrification has on those who live there currently. Francis talks about this economy of exclusion and inequality where the powerful feed upon the powerless. The powerless in many of these gentrification scenarios are the community members. Their voices are quieted, even silenced by big commercial interests, economic developers, and investors looking for cheap property to grow their own economies. The community is, is excluded, people are displaced, and their community, their homes, tradition, culture, and collective efficacy are thrown away to make way for the newest, coolest, and next trendy neighborhood. In a very challenging way, Francis asks us to examine the way our entire system works. This argument that gentrification has a natural economic flow is disputed by the gospel teachings to love and serve the poor above your own economic interests. The argument for increased economic development rings hollow, hollow when Jesus talks about getting a log through the eye of a camel. The excuse that gentrification is inevitable and will happen quiets the call of the gospel for radical inclusion. So how do we grapple with all of this? How do we engage those in power, and how do we recognize our own complicity? How do we challenge the culture? How do we challenge this disposable culture? How do we stop the disposal and displacement of communities? I think first and foremost, we need to understand community and elevate the voices in our communities that are not always heard. And after that, we need to channel Pope Francis and the teachings of Christ when we talk about <coughs> community in its wholeness. Because as Pope St. Paul says, for the body is not one member, but many. And it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we, bes be we bestow much more abundant honor. But God has so composed the body that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We have a call, a distinct and certain call, to honor all members of our communities. No one, no matter her color, his ethnicity, their religious or socioeconomic status, can simply be disposed of.
Um, in the meantime, while Matt's giving his presentation, uh, start thinking of some questions you can ask the panel um, after uh, Matt gives his presentation. So some questions for all of them. Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> So in 2010, uh, Tom Dart started halting evictions because of the uh, housing crisis. And he was also, um, and before that, Cook County Courts had done a poor job of enforcing evictions from apartments. Um, which means that when people like my grandpa try to get his rent, which he's contractually obligated um, to receive, uh, it's almost impossible for him to receive that. Uh, which means that he's actually encouraged to go to court sooner because if he doesn't, he's gonna lose more rent. So the social justice question is, um, so I think we can agree that not evicting people who are on hard times is a socially just thing to do. But um, there's also a social justice aspect to helping the elderly. Um, and so I just wanna know, uh, and I'd like to get a response. Uh, if my grandparents are elderly, this is part of their income, uh, don't they, isn't there also a social justice aspect to them receiving what they're due? Um, so, so, something about. Okay, so a few things, uh, causes of gentrification, uh, stable families, we know that um, two parent families, their chance of being poverty are between five and 10%. Employment, renovation, so maybe you put a new uh, <clears throat> coat of paint on a house, something like that. Uh, businesses moving in, and then I just said communities, so there's a new garden opening up on Peterson. I know, uh, I'm talking about like Little League, things like this. Um, so these are things that cause gentrification. Um, the second question is, are these things which are good or are these things are these things which are bad? I would argue that they're um, things which are good. Uh, it's just some more things. Um, gentrification development. Um, so one thing Laura talked about was poor people being displaced. There's a study by Daniel Hartley of the Federal Reserve in Cleveland, and he found that actually if you lived in a gentrified neighborhood, your credit score would increase by eight points, 
uh, delinquent accounts, meaning people who hadn't paid their bills in 90 days, fell, um, which means that people were having less trouble paying their bills. Uh, <clears throat> renters and mortgage holders saw this uh, benefit. And people who moved out of the neighborhood had a nine point increase in credit score, which means they weren't moving out because they were poor, they were actually wealthier, or being, getting better at paying their bills too. Um, and the other thing is, we talked about, I know when property values go up, that is an issue, um, but that would, you can also trace it back to things like high property taxes, and I'm not a fan of property taxes, so I'm not, I'm all against cutting property taxes. Um, and the other thing is, if you're older, you can sell your house and you can rent it you can, you can sell your house to someone and rent an uh, equal sized house or apartment for 30, something like 30 years. Um, so if you're 65 and you want to sell your house, your property value is going up, you can take that money and then you can rent for 30 years, which should be plenty of time. So, <clears throat> sort of where I'm coming from, so I'm actually from the south suburbs of Chicago, I'm from Chicago Heights. Um, it's pretty good. It's, sorry, it borders Fort Heights, which is the poorest town in the United States of America. Um, <clears throat> so it's also in the south suburbs by towns like Harvey, Richmond Park. Um, my friend Manny was actually, he was with uh, Habitat for Humanity, and they built a house in Park Forest, which is right next to where I live. Um, so these are just some of the houses. Um, so when I go home on the weekends or uh, for spring break or something like that, I take the metro, which goes to the south suburbs. Um, and so this is, uh, these are like Harvey, Chicago Heights, places like that, kind of places that are run, uh, kind of run down. So for me, I sort of see gentrification as a solution. Uh, I see, I think it would be great if a developer came in, bought up cheap land, redid the houses, brought businesses in. For me, that's a great thing that we should be encouraging. Um, so one quick example from Chicago, um, the alderman uh, who actually used to intern for Joe Moore, uh, tried to put a minimum wage of ten dollars and ten cents back in two thousand seven before uh, starting the new thing to push now on uh, big box stores, meaning Walmart. And uh, at first, everyone was on board with it. Uh, if you guys don't know, the city of Chicago is controlled by the Democrats. And um, but then what happened is the South Side alderman, who often represented poor, black, or Hispanic wards actually found out this was a good thing because they only had pretty much liquor stores and rundown buildings and so Walmart, which I guess was aiding gentrification, moved in. And this is a quote from, I think it's a resident or alderman, and says, the super center single-handedly eliminated the food desert folks in Pullman and Roseland had suffered in for a decade or more. So this means they came in and they provided jobs. I think they provided something like 400 jobs in the Pullman neighborhood, including access to cheaper food. Um, so that's sort of a positive aspect of transportation I see. And I, if you look at it sort of from a more broad sense, if you're living in a place that's, you have to walk by boarded up windows, you have to walk by, there's no jobs. It's sort of this fatalistic sense of how do I get out of this? And so I see gentrification and development as a way to get out of this, as a way to make people's lives better and um, things like that. <clears throat> so um, to end with, I just have a few kind of Catholic social teaching thoughts, um, going off the idea that, uh, going off the idea that gentrification, economic development are a good thing, with some small caveats, um, which I think we'll get into in the questions. And um, so I'm just gonna read a few thoughts from Catholic social teaching. <clears throat> so it's this from Forming Conscious for Faithful Citizenship. It says, a basic moral test for our society is how we treat the most vulnerable in our midst. This is from A Place at the Table, a Catholic recommitment to overcome poverty and to respect the dignity of all God's children. The table we seek for all rests on these four institutions or legs. What families and individuals can do, so that means stable families, two-parent homes. <clears throat> what community and religious institutions can do, that means Loyola as both a school and religious institution, as well as different um, fraternities, things that Pope Leo XIII talked about, religious associations, fraternities, things like that what the private sector can do, so that would be economic development, and what the government can do to work together to overcome poverty. So this would be things like lowering property taxes, making it easier to build to bring competition and lower rents. Um, I'll just read one more. This is from Economic Justice for All, the U.S. Catholic Bishops, 1986. Pretty good year. Uh, it, it entails a more profound kind of deprivation. A denial of full participation in the economic, social, and political life of society, and an inability to influence decisions that affect one's life. 
So I just want to kind of conclude by arguing that gentrification, bringing jobs in, fixing a neighborhood up, um, building that community, whether it's a community garden, a community park, the local baseball league, things like that, those are things we should be pushing for. Those are Catholic social teaching, community, family, participation. Economic development doesn't push poor people out, it includes them in the economy by providing jobs, providing opportunity for them to start their own businesses, to, um, to kind of move up uh, in life. And um, I think that's where we'll end, and then we're gonna go to questions.